All right. transgender wedding and so she reached out to the pastor and saying that she's not sure what she should do uh how can she support her grandson um you know being in a being a part of a transgender wedding like should she attend should she not attend as a christian like what do you do if you're watching this or listening to this and you're a Christian, well, I think the default response should automatically be probably shouldn't attend. Probably not a good idea, even though it is your grandson. To me, that should have been his response, you know, in, in a loving way, saying, I'm sorry, miss. Um, it's a difficult situation your grandson but you know we have to abide by the bible what does the bible say therefore probably you can't go that's what you would have thought but his response is what just sent shockwaves throughout christendom and this guy is a well-known pastor in the reformed theological circles as well and the advice that he gave was this. Does, does your grandson know that you're not okay with it? And she was like, yes. Does he know that the Bible doesn't condone it? And she said, yes. Well, he said, as long as those things have been established and to keep the peace, to not burn bridges, that she should go to 
her grandson's transgender wedding. And not only that, but buy them a gift as well. This was the counsel from a well-known pastor who's been pastoring for decades to this woman. And that clip went viral, and he has since responded to all of the, the stuff that's all of the, the social media frenzy that was created by it, and he doubled down on his take, basically saying that for the sake of love, for the sake of compassion, for the sake of not committing offense, the grandma should do what she should go to the wedding, and I'm not recanting that advice or counsel. So this is then what led me to obviously making this video because I'm not just going to deal with what he said. I kind of want to take it a step further and go a bit deeper and ask the question, would Jesus attend an LGBTQQIP2SAA wedding? These are all of the, the, the letters and numbers now. And so for those of you who don't know what that means, it's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, pansexual, two-spirit, asexual, and ally. So would Jesus attend a wedding for those who fall into these categories, not just transgender, but across the board? Because whatever the answer is to that question of would Jesus attend, whatever his answer would be should be our answer. And so I actually, I, I, I posted a short 30-second uh, video on this on Instagram just to test the waters into those that follow me on Instagram and just to see where they stand and, and what what the temperature is, at least with those that follow me. And, uh, and then I, I took a poll as well. So I, I got over 430 comments on the reel. And there was a lot of, I didn't actually count to see how many comments were in support or in opposition to my video, which I clearly took the position that a Christian shouldn't attend an LGBTQ plus wedding. But there are a ton of quote unquote Christians who were coming at me and who were basically, you know, saying, Joel, you're just pushing hate here. You're 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 not being loving. You're not uh you're just judging people and blah, 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 blah. But then I did the poll in my Instagram stories and 90% of the people were in agreement with me to 10%. So my videos, they tend to not just go with my followers. They kind of go out into Instagram land. And so maybe I was hitting a lot of people who were not following me, who saw the real. But it just, it, it showed me that this is something that, that needs to be talked about because it's an issue that's going to become more and more prevalent in churches. This isn't not a fringe example. I mean, even five years ago, I was pastoring at a church. And after the morning service, I was standing by our welcome desk for, for newcomers to come up and introduce themselves and meet some of the pastors. So I was standing there and this lady walks up and she was smiling and, and, uh, and she says, great service, but I have a question for you. My son is gay. What is your church's stance on that? And it was just, it kind of threw me a bit because I was not expecting that to be literally, you know, her, her first response after the service was good and boom. And so I can't remember the exact words that I said, but I basically said, your son is welcome. Um, to uh, to attend, but 
we are a Bible, a Bible believing church. And we believe that the scriptures teach that that sort of lifestyle is, is, is sinful. And so we're not going to shy away from that. If we are, you know, preaching through a particular book in the Bible and we, and that subject arises, we're going to talk about it. And, and so I said something along those lines. And so her response was, well, then we won't be attending this church. And then she walked away. And that's five years ago. And so now it's, it's become more and more prevalent in churches and it's only going to grow more and more. And so this is why having this conversation and talking about this is super important for pastors, but also for Christians in general attending church. Because this is going to be a thing that's going to become more and more common. And so the first thing I want to do is we want to answer the question, would Jesus attend an LGBTQ plus wedding? That's, that's the question we're asking. And so to start this off, I want to define what marriage is and then look at some scriptures that relate to this kind of thing and see what, what the Bible says. It's always, it's always important to start with the text. So the Lexham Survey of Theology defines holy matrimony or marriage as a complete and comprehensive union oriented toward procreation, covenantal and lifelong, between one man and one woman. So a comprehensive union oriented toward procreation that's covenantal and lifelong between one man and one woman. That's the biblical definition of marriage. And it's important to obviously understand that that definition, that the meaning of marriage was instituted and created by God, not government, not culture, not man, but God is the one who decided what marriage is and what it involves. Matthew 19 verses 4 and 5, this is what Jesus said. Okay, so now we're going to get into some scriptures just to kind of take a brief survey of the text to see what God says. So Jesus said in Matthew 19, verses 4 and 5, he says, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So this is Jesus referring back to what was written in Genesis. Again, marriage involves one man and one woman, male and female. This was created by God. Leviticus 18.22. Now, this is where we're going to get into some murky waters here with, with a lot of segments of the church. Leviticus 18.22 says, You shall not sleep with a male as one sleeps with a female. It is an abomination. So in the, book, in the book of Leviticus, God says it is an abomination for a male to sleep with another male as one sleeps with a female. It's wrong. And you say, well, maybe that's just the Old Testament. We're not under the law, Old Testament law. We're in the New Testament. Okay, well, let's go to the New Testament. Romans chapter 1, verses 24 to to 27 says this. It says, Therefore God gave them up to vile impurity and the lusts of their hearts so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for falsehood and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. So God's talking about here, or Paul's talking about here, he's talking about people who have given themselves over to vile impurity in the lust of their flesh, who rejected God, God's standards, God's ways. And so God's like, okay, I'm pulling back. You all do what you want to do. And this is the result of that. 
For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for that which is contrary to nature. And likewise, the men too abandoned natural relations with women and burned in their desire toward one another, males with males committing shameful acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their heir. So here Paul is, he's, he's stating that the result of rejecting God, of rejecting his ways, of not acknowledging him as the creator and Lord of the universe, turning your back, the result of then God saying, I'm, I'm giving you over. You do what you want to do now. That lesbian and homosexual relations were a result of that. This is not speaking of this in a positive light. This is the result of a depraved mind, depraved behavior. So in Romans 1, this practice is not seen positive, is not seen as something that glorifies God, that God is cool with. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 now, verses 9 and 10. Paul writes, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor those habitually drunk, nor verbal abusers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord. Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. So he's talking, he's highlighting the specific set of sins that they were, that was some of them prior to their salvation. So prior to coming to Christ, these were some of the behaviors and things that they did. But since they became followers of Jesus, since they were sanctified and justified, that they Put those behaviors behind them. So these aren't things to be proud of. These aren't a list of things that Christians, that followers of Jesus should partake in. And then finally, 1 Timothy 1 verses 8 to 11 says this, But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and worldly, for those who kill their fathers and their and mothers, for murderers, for the sex, for the sexually immoral, for homosexuals, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. So again, this list that Paul is highlighting, it's not an exhaustive list, but this list is a <clears throat> List of things that rebellious and ungodly people, sinners, unholy, worldly people partake in. These aren't traits and behaviors of people who are followers of Jesus, who are Christians, who have given their whole lives over to the Lord. This is not the kind of things that you strive for, and that should be prevalent in, in their life. So it's clear that the Bible is not in favor of any kind of homosexual interaction, men with men, women with women. Not okay with that. You, you can't read these texts and come to a different conclusion. Now, there will be people out there and I hear them and I see them who will try to take these verses and twist them and they'll, or they'll try to reinterpret them saying, you know, these, this homosexuality that's being talked about from Leviticus all the way on to the New Testament, it's, it's, it's referring to cult prostitution, sex cults. It's not referring to monogamous homosexual relationships, you know, one 
one man with with one man, one woman with one woman. This is it's not speaking of that. Guys, this is that that that's utter nonsense. That is a poor attempt at trying to change the text to fit a particular lifestyle, a particular sin. It's an attempt to try to to manipulate the text to have it say what you want it to say. The text does not say that. And for thousands of years was not interpreted any other way. It's only in recent times that there's been an attempt made at trying to change what the Bible clearly has taught. Now, in terms of the other parts, right, of the LGBTQ, so of the LGBTQ plus the transgender, the asexual, pansexual, all of that, the Bible doesn't specifically list each one of those. And so some will try to say, well, the Bible doesn't talk about those things, so maybe that's okay. Guys, they all fall under the same umbrella because it violates the standard that God has already set. So if marriage is between one man and one woman, then clearly transgender relationships don't make the cut here. Asexual relationships, pansexual relationships, I mean, a lot of these things, I don't even know. I don't even know what they mean. But regardless, all of that falls under that umbrella of things that violate the standard that God has set. One man, one woman, lifelong covenant. That's it. So all this other stuff, this other sexual orientation and identification that gets created is all false and violates what God has clearly defined in his word. And then anything else that gets created as we cuz these letters just keep going. As long as it violates what God has clearly lined out in scripture, it's false. It's not godly. God is not cool with it. So then in light of what we just read, what do you all think? Would Jesus attend a wedding for those in the LGBTQ plus categories? Seriously, think about it. In light of what we just read, and those verses, again, it's, it's, it's not even exhaustive. There are more scriptures that speak to the same things here. I just did a quick survey with the main, the more popular verses, the more well-known verses. Would Jesus attend a wedding involving people in those who identify in those ways? I don't know how you can read those texts and other than butchering them and twisting them and making them say what they don't say, you could come to the conclusion where it's a no. Like, I don't know how you do that. So I don't think Jesus would go. I think his word clearly states and points to the fact that he would not go. So then why has this become such a massive issue in our culture? And in particular, in the church. If I'm suggesting that it is super simple and super easy to, to decipher what God is saying, then, then, then why has it become such a massive issue. Why is it such a big deal that a well-known pastor gave this advice to a grandma? Why, why has that gone viral? Does he not know what the text says? He's been in ministry for decades, preaching the Bible. He is from the Reformed theological perspective. So these guys are heavy in their theology and their doctrine. And what about all these other pastors and quote unquote Christians that have become progressive in their theology? Do they not know what the text says? What is the disconnect here? Where is the confusion coming in? Why is this why is this an issue? 
And so I believe that, that the confusion comes in, or at least one of the main reasons why the, there's been such a mass confusion coming into the church is because of a gross misunderstanding and misuse of the term love. If there's a word that has become twisted and manipulated and literally hijacked by the devil himself, it's the word love. And the fact is, through his inspiration and his influence, our culture has defined the word love to basically mean unconditional acceptance and approval. That's what it means. To love someone in our culture today means that you unequivocally, unconditionally approve and accept anyone and whatever choices and beliefs that they have with no room to offer feedback, critique, no room to question. It's just on it. Unconditional approval and acceptance. That's what it means to be loving, to show love, to walk in love. Just to allow someone to be whoever they are, do whatever they want to do, and not have the space to question that, to challenge, to disagree. Because if you do, then what happens? And I've been called all of these things that I'm flowing with hate. You're someone who flows with hate. If you don't follow that belief, you're a bigot and you're judgmental and you're not practicing love. So that's where we're at in our culture when it comes to love. And so it's one thing for secular society to embrace this view of love. That I understand. That's, that's just where things have gone. Our culture preaches that, they live that, but it's a completely different thing when this kind of teaching and belief of love makes its way into the church. See, this is the issue. This is where we have a problem. When the church begins to adopt the culture's view and then begins to teach that as doctrine and truth and allows a twisting of the scriptures and a complete redefining of things so that they can fit with the culture so that the church and the culture can become best friends and this is what's been happening over the last number of years with the whole progressive christianity push where you have whole denominations embracing this false idea of love, thus allowing for transgender pastors and leaders, homosexual and lesbian pastors and leaders in the church, leading churches, all the way down to churches going to pride parades and waving the rainbow flag in the church and all in the name of love. So when you have a well-known evangelical pastor who offers advice to a grandma and advising her that showing love in this situation is her attending so as to not burn any bridges, that this should send shock waves throughout the church and show cause for great concern. Because what if this begins a ripple effect? What if the, the government and the lawmakers of the land begin to squeeze the church even more about things that they're allowed to talk about and things that they're allowed to address? What if that happens? This is why this is such a big deal and why this needs to be addressed. Because having this cultural driven and defined definition of love inf influence the church 
is deadly. It's going to literally lead to the self-implosion of the church. And so this is why the church must properly defend and communicate what love actually is and stand for the truth of what God has already revealed in the scripture, what he said. Not wavering, not trying to change it or twist it to make it more palpable for people. The Bible is clear on what love is. And I don't have time today to walk through all the verses that <laughs> speak about love. We'd be here for, for, for days. But the most famous portion of Scripture when talking about love is 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 7, which says this, Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act disgracefully. It does not seek its own benefit. It is not provoked. does not keep an account of wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness or wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. It keeps every confidence. It believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You see, verse 6 here is massive. It says, it being love. Love doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness. It doesn't rejoice. It doesn't celebrate wrongdoing. Love, true love, doesn't do that. But instead, it rejoices or celebrates with the truth. True biblical love cannot celebrate sin. It can't. If someone is being true to the scripture, with how the scripture reveals and talks about love, true love then cannot celebrate or tolerate or rejoice in sin. Can't happen. So for those listening and watching right now and those of you who are disagreeing with me, and maybe you are in complete alliance with the advice that Alistair Begg offered the grandma, or maybe you're in complete agreement with the definition of, of, of our culture's definition of love. Again, which is unconditional approval and acceptance. Maybe that's what you think love is. The idea where we can't judge, can't critique, can't disagree. You just got to accept and approve of everyone, no matter what. Well, let's get practical here and see how this logic plays out in other areas. And so I want to go back to 1 Corinthians 6 for a second. Verses that we already read, verses 9 and 10. It says, again, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor those habitually drunk, nor verbal abusers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. So I want to look at this list for a second here. Using this cultural definition of love as our hermeneutic, as our filter. So let's just say, and I'm speaking to Christians right now, those of you who are listening or watching and you call yourself a Christian, a believer and who Jesus is and what he's done, and you're disagreeing with me right now. Let's say you're, you have a best friend and they're married, but they called you up and they told you that they want to go to a swingers party, go to a massive orgy. And they said they wanted to use you as an excuse to get out of the house so that you can go and your spouse doesn't know. Let's say they called you up and said, hey, I want to go to this massive party over here, um, but I can't obviously can't tell my spouse, so can I just say that I'm hanging out with you? 
Are you cool with that? And then can you drive me there, drop me off, and then pick me up when it's done? What would you say? Would you simply say, you know what? You know what? I, I think this is wrong. I don't agree with this. I don't condone it. The Bible doesn't condone it. But you know what? I, I want to be loving here. So yes, you can use me as, as, your, as your excuse. I will gladly do that. Would you actually do that? Of course not. Another example. Let's say you have a, a teenage son. And they're like, you know what? Dad or mom, I, uh, I need to have, or I want more money. And I don't have any. So I'm going to go rob a bank. Um, would you mind driving the getaway car for me? Now, would you tell your kid, you know what, I, that's wrong. Like, you shouldn't do that. I'm not condoning it. Um, but you know what, I want to be loving right now. So I'm not condoning it, but you know what, yes, I will. I'll drive the getaway car. Clearly, you wouldn't do that. Third example, let's say you have a friend who is an alcoholic. And they are asking you to go and buy them a whole bunch of booze. Let's say they have no money and they're asking you to go buy them a whole bunch of booze. Knowing that they're going to just get plastered, would you go buy them the booze? Would you support their alcoholism? Or would you say, you know what, I, I, I don't agree with this. I think that you need to get help. You shouldn't be drinking. I'm not condoning this, but hey, you know what? I, I, I want to be loving here, so I'll buy you the booze. Clearly, you wouldn't do that. And I could walk through this list, and the answer would be no to each situation. But except when we get to the matters of LGBTQ, it's like we change. We flip the script. We change how we interpret, how we view it. And we play that love card. And we get sucked into this cultural mindset of the word love. We, we don't use that for anything else, but this we do. True Bible study, real Bible study, says you can't just pick and choose how you want to define things. The text says what it says. You don't get to pick and choose things that you want to obey, things that you agree with, and then other things that you don't. That's not how this works. So no, Christians should not go to these kinds of weddings. No matter if it's your kid, because I have people, Joel, I certainly, I wish that your kid grows up gay so that you're put in this situation. I hope your kid becomes gay. This is what people say. I was like, uh, it doesn't matter if it's your kid, family, close friend. If it was my son, my daughter, I promise you 100% I would not. I, I love them. I would tell them I love them but I would not go to that wedding because literally by going to the wedding, if I were to go to my son's wedding or my daughter's wedding, that would be the most unloving thing I could do. See, culture says, no, it's the most loving thing you could do. No, it's the most unloving thing you could do. The Bible says, right? Don't rejoice in unrighteousness. That's not love. Celebrating in sin, celebrating in someone else's sin is not love. It's not love. But you're saying that you don't approve of it. You're saying that, you know, you don't agree with it and they know that. You're, so you're, you're, just, you're just being supportive. That's nonsense because that argument doesn't work with anything else. It's not love. Now, I'm not saying that this is easy. I'm not saying that it, it doesn't come with consequence, doesn't come with difficulty. 
But at the end of the day, we have to follow what Jesus says. See, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will obey my commandments. Jesus said that, talking about real love. If you love Jesus, you'll obey what he says. So violating what Jesus says in the name of loving people is a sin. Violating what Jesus says in the name of loving people is a sin. And I think that this is going to become more and more mainstream as culture progresses, as, as, as life progresses here. And it's going to cause a lot of churches and leaders to have to make some difficult choices. And they're going to, churches are going to have to wrestle with this question, who are you going to serve, God or the culture? Who are you going to serve? Are you going to get sucked in to culture, to be accepted, to receive approval? Are you going to get sucked into this twisting and manipulating of Scripture to make it say what it doesn't actually say, to fit in, to not ruffle any feathers, to not offend anybody? Or are you going to, to adhere to what God says? I'm talking in a very harsh tone here on purpose because this is such a massive and important situation here. Because the life of the church, the relevance of the church, the significance of the church, this is what's at stake. The very authority of the Bible is being challenged, I think, in, in greater ways. The authenticity of the Bible, the legitimacy is being challenged, is being questioned. This is a big deal. And this question just highlights that, that fact. And it's going to put a lot of people, a lot of Christians, a lot of leaders in difficult situations, challenging situations. And there may be consequences. And this is not new in terms of the church suffering for standing up for what God has said. I mean, look at the early church. Us here in North America, we haven't suffered persecution. We have no idea what that means. The rest, the rest of the world laughs, I think, at the things that us here in the West deal with in terms of our church. Like right now, Christians are dying every day, dying for their faith. And our big thing is, you know, standing up for what the Bible says to this minority segment of people. This is, this is our persecution. Like it doesn't even compare, but this is just the beginning or potentially the beginning of where government lawmakers could start squeezing more and more, ramping up more and more. And then the church is going to have to make some choices. Are you going to cave or are you not going to cave? And so that's why this is, this is a big deal. And so, no. Again, I don't think Jesus would attend such a wedding. Uh, I think Jesus would. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus would not hang out with, be friends with those in the LGBTQ plus community. The Bible is very clear. He hung out with the tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes, the outsiders. He hung out with them, yes. But hanging out is different than celebrating their sin. There's a difference there. And that's what we have to understand as Christians. That when it comes to, there, there is a line that needs to be drawn in the sand that you won't step over. You can, we're, we're called to love people. We're called to be Jesus to people, literally be Jesus to someone else. We are the hands and the feet of Jesus on the earth, empowered by the Spirit. So yes, 
but loving people doesn't celebrate sin. And we're to never violate what Jesus says in the name of loving people. We got to take God's word for what it says and then trust that he can do what only he can do in the lives of those in our life. Well, that's it for episode 26. That's my rant. Um, yeah, I hope that made sense. Uh, if you, I'd love to hear your feedback and your comments about this episode. So if you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to leave them in the description below. Um, you can email me. My email will be in the description below as well. I just, I encourage, I encourage you all. If you're watching this, you're Christians, stand firm. Stand firm in the faith. Don't waver. Um, bring your bring your concerns, bring your questions, bring them to God. Bring them to Jesus. Um, and ask him for strength to just to live this stuff out because it's it's not going to get any easier. And so thanks so much for watching, for listening, and uh, have an awesome rest of your day or evening. And we will see you all in the next episode. Much love and God bless.